Hi there, it's Brenda. Um, welcome to Book Shorts. So tonight I am going to be reading out of the book Nonviolent Communication and A Language of Life. This is by Marshall B. Rosenberg. And uh, I came upon his work at a convention one time and I bought this book and you can see that he signed it there. So that's kind of cool. Um, there's a lot in this book, obviously, uh, when somebody writes a book, they want you to read the whole thing. <laughs> I can't read the whole thing tonight. I am just going to share some pieces out of it for you. Um, this is an excellent book that really changed the way that I was able to communicate with people. I learned a new way. I even took um, an extended class at the Naropa Institute in Boulder with my sister, uh, an extended study <clears throat> in this. And I just think it's remarkable work and we should send a copy to everybody in Washington. <laughs> okay, so he starts out. Um, chapter one, giving from the heart. The heart of nonviolent communication. This is an introduction. He says, believing that it is our nature to enjoy giving and receiving in a compassionate manner, I have been preoccupied most of my life with two questions. What happens to disconnect us from our compassionate nature, leading us to behave violently and exploitatively? And conversely, what allows some people to stay connected to their compassionate nature under even the most trying circumstances? <clears throat> I'm skipping through some of the pages here. A way to focus attention, he says. NVC is what he calls nonviolent communication, is founded on language and communication skills that strengthen our ability to remain human, even under trying conditions. It contains nothing new. All that has been integrated into NVC has been known for centuries. The intent is to remind us about what we already know about how we humans were meant to relate to one another and to assist us in living in a way that concretely manifests this knowledge. NVC guides us in reframing how we express ourselves and hear others. Instead of being habitual, automatic reactions, our words become conscious responses based firmly on an awareness of what we are perceiving, feeling, and wanting. We are led to express ourselves with honesty and clarity while simultaneously paying others a respectful and empath empath empathic attention. Sorry. In any exchange, we come to hear our own deeper needs and those of others. NVC trains us to observe carefully and to be able to specify behaviors and conditions that are affecting us. We learn to identify and clearly articulate what we are concretely wanting in a given situation. The form is simple, yet powerfully transformative. As NVC replaces our old patterns of defending, withdrawing, or attacking in the face of judgment and criticism, we come to perceive ourselves and others as well as our intentions and relationships in a new light. Resistance, defensiveness, and violent reactions are minimized. When we focus on clarifying what is being observed, felt and needed, rather than on diagnosing and judging, we discover the depth of our own compassion. Through its emphasis on deep listening to ourselves as well as others, NVC fosters respect, attentiveness, and empathy, and engenders a mutual desire to give from the heart. Uh, okay, so that's a little from the introduction. The NVC process. To arrive at a mutual desire to give from the heart, 
we focus the light of our consciousness on four areas, referred to as the four components of the NBC model. First, we observe what is actually happening in a situation. What are, what are we observing others saying or doing that is either enriching or not enriching our life? The trick is to be able to articulate this observation without introducing any judgment or evaluation. To simply say what people are doing that we either like or don't like. Next, we state how we feel when we observe this action. Are we hurt, scared, joyful, amused, irritated, etc.? And thirdly, we say what needs of ours are connected to the feelings we have identified. An awareness of these three components is present when we use NVC to clearly and honestly express how we are. For example, a mother might express these three pieces to her teenage son by saying, Felix, when I see two balls of soiled socks under the coffee table and another three next to the TV, I feel irritated because I am needing more order in the rooms that we share in common. She would follow immediately with the fourth component, a very specific request. Would you be willing to put your socks in your room or in the washing machine? This fourth component addresses what we are wanting from the other person that would enrich our lives or make life more wonderful for us. Thus, part of MVC is to express these four pieces of information very clearly, whether verbally or by other means. The other aspect of this communication consists of receiving the same four pieces of, of information from others. We connect with them by first sensing what they are observing, feeling, and needing, and then discover what would enrich their lives by receiving the fourth piece, their request. As we keep our attention focused on the areas mentioned and help others do likewise, we establish a flow of communication back and forth until compassion manifests naturally. What I am observing, feeling, and needing. What I am requesting to enrich my life. What you are observing, feeling, and needing. What you are requesting to enrich your life. Okay, so he's got a little box here that says, the, the NVC process, so this is the process of the whole book that he talks about. The concrete actions we are observing that are affecting our well-being. Number two, how we feel in relation to what we are observing. Number three, the needs, values, desires that are creating our feelings. And number four, the concrete actions we request in order to enrich our lives. When we use this process, we may begin either by expressing ourselves or by empathetically receiving these four pieces of information from others. Although we will learn to listen for and verbally express each of these components in the, in the following chapters, it is important to keep in mind that NVC does not consist of a set formula, but adapts to various situations, as well as personal and cultural styles. While I conveniently refer to NVC as a process or a language, it is possible to experience all four pieces of the process without uttering a single word. The essence of NVC is to be found in our consciousness of these four components, not in the actual words that are exchanged. 
So back here in the box, so we've got the process it is a four-step process. There are two parts of it. Part one is me expressing honesty through the four components. And part two is me receiving empathetically through the four components. So that that's a communication back and forth. I express honestly using the four components and I receive honestly and empathetically using the four components, okay? Let's see. <clears throat> Skipping forward a little here. The first component of MVC entails the separation of observation from evaluation. We need to clearly observe what we are seeing, hearing, or touching that is affecting our sense of well-being without mixing in any evaluation. Observations are an important element in MVC where we wish to clearly and honestly express how we are to another person. When we combine observation with evaluation, however, we decrease the likelihood that others will hear our intended message. Instead, they are apt to hear criticism and thus resist what we are saying. NVC does not mandate that we remain completely objective and refrain from evaluating. It only requires that we maintain a separation between our observations and our evaluations. NBC is a process language that discourages static generalizations. Instead, evaluations are to be based on observations specific to time and context. The Indian philosopher Krishnamurti once remarked that observing without evaluating is the highest form of human intelligence. When I first read this statement, the thought, what nonsense, shot through my mind before I realized that I had just made an evaluation. For most of us, it is difficult to make observations of people and their behavior that are free of judgment, criticism, or other forms of analysis. I became acutely aware of this difficulty while working with an elementary school where the staff and principal often reported communication difficulties. The district superintendent had requested that I help them resolve the conflict. First, I was to confer with the staff and then with the staff and principal together. I opened the meeting by asking the staff, what is the principal doing that conflicts with your needs? He has a big mouth, came the, the swift response. My question called for an observation, but while big mouth gave me information on how this teacher evaluated the principal, it failed to describe what the principal said or did that led to the teacher's interpretation that he had a big mouth. When I pointed this out, a second teacher offered, I know what he means. The principal talks too much. Instead of a clear observation of the principal's behavior, this was also an evaluation of how much the principal talked. A third teacher then declared, he thinks only he has anything worth saying. I explained that interfering what, an, no, I explained that inferring what another person is thinking is not the same as observing his behavior. Finally, a fourth teacher ventured. He wants to be the center of attention all the time. After I remarked that this too was an inference of what another person is wanting. Two teachers blurted in unison, well, your question is very hard to answer. 
<clears throat> we work together to create a list identifying specific behaviors on the part of the principal that bothered them and made sure that the list was free of evaluation. For example, the principal told stories about his childhood and war experiences during faculty meetings with the result that meetings sometimes ran 20 minutes over time. When I asked whether they had ever communicated their annoyance to the principal, the staff replied they had tried, but only through evaluative comments. They had never made reference to specific behaviors, such as his storytelling, and agreed to bring these up when we were all to meet together. Almost as soon as the meeting began, I saw what the staff had been telling me. No matter what was being discussed, the principal would interject. This reminds me of the time. And then launch into a story about his childhood or war experience. I waited for the staff to voice their discomfort around the principal's behavior. However, instead of nonviolent non communication, they applied nonverbal condemnation. Some rolled their eyes, others yawned pointedly. One stared at his watch. I endured this painful scenario until finally I asked, isn't anyone going to say, any, say something? An awkward silence ensued. The teacher who had spoken first at our meeting screwed up his courage, looked directly at the principal and said, Ed, you have a big mouth. As this story illustrates, it's not always easy to shed our old habits and master the ability to separate observation from evaluation. Eventually, the teacher succeeded in clarifying for the principal the specific actions that led to their concern. The principal listened earnestly and then pressed, why didn't one of you tell me before? He admitted he was aware of the storytelling habit and then began a story pertaining to this habit. I interrupted him, observing good-naturedly that he was doing it again. We ended our meeting developing ways for the staff to let their principal know in a gentle way when his stories weren't appreciated. So he goes on to talk uh, in this chapter about distinguishing observations from evaluations. And really what I got from this is an evaluation is, is when you are putting your opinion into it rather than just observing what is going on. Your opinion goes into that as well. Um, and he's got a, a couple of examples in um, kind of a lot of like worksheet type things to work through in this book. Um, Example of observation with evaluation mixed in. The sentence, you are too generous, okay? So the example of an observation separate from evaluation would be, when I see you give all your lunch money to others, I think you're being too generous. See the difference? Here's another one. This is observation with evaluation. So this is really my opinion of the observation. Doug procrastinates. When I take out that opinion or that ev evaluation, my observation becomes Doug only studies for exams the night before. See the difference in language there? So he goes on uh, to talk about the, the distinguishing observations from evaluations. And you can see how uh, when you observe something with your evaluation in it, it's going to be taken as criticism. Um, okay. I'm going to move on. Uh, to chapter four, identifying and expressing feelings. Okay, so we talked about observation. That was the first, number one in the process. And now we're talking about feelings, expressing feelings. Um, let's go. Feelings versus non-feelings. 
A common confusion generated by the English language is our use of the word feel without actually expressing a feeling. For example, in the sentence, I feel I didn't get a fair deal. The words I feel could be more accu accurately replaced with I think. In general, feelings are not being clearly expressed when the word feel is followed by words such as that, like, or if. I feel that you should know better. I feel like a failure. I feel as if I'm living with a wall. Okay. Also, uh, feelings are not clearly expressed when they're followed by the pronoun I, you, she, they, or it. I feel I am constantly on call. I feel it is useless. Or they're followed by names or nouns referring to people. I feel Amy has been pretty responsible. I feel my boss is being manipulative. Conversely, in the English, English language, it is not necessary at all to use the word feel when we are actually expressing a feeling. We can say, I'm feeling irritated or simply, I'm irritated. So uh, in this, he's got some little gray boxes in this that uh, highlight some areas. And in one of them, it says, distinguish between what we feel and what we think we are. In NVC, we distinguish between words that express actual feelings and those that describe what we think we are. Description of what we think we are. Okay, these are, these are uh, examples. I feel inadequate as a guitar player. In this statement, I am assessing my ability as a guitar player rather than clearly expressing my feelings. These are expressions of actual feelings, examples of actual feelings, expressing my feelings. I feel disappointed in my, myself as a guitar player. I feel impatient with myself as a guitar player. I feel frustrated with myself as a guitar player. The actual feeling behind my assessment of myself as inadequate could therefore be disappointment, impatient, frustration, or some other emotion. Likewise, it is helpful to differentiate between words that describe what we think others are doing around us and words that describe actual feelings. The following are examples of statements that are easily mistaken as expressions of feelings. In fact, they reveal more how we think others are behaving than what we are actually feeling ourselves. A example. I feel unimportant to the people with whom I work. The word unimportant describes how I think others are evaluating me rather than an actual feeling, which in this situation might be, I feel sad or I feel discouraged. Example B, I feel misunderstood. Here, the word misunderstood indicates my assessment of the other person's level of understanding rather than an actual feeling. In this situation, I may be feeling anxious or annoyed or some other emotion. C, I feel ignored. Again, this is more of an interpretation of the actions of others rather than a clear statement of how we are feeling. No doubt there have been times we thought we were being ignored and our feeling was relief because we wanted to be left to ourselves. No doubt there were other times, however, when we felt hurt when we thought we were being ignored because we had wanted to be involved. Words like ignored express how we interpret others rather than how we feel. Okay, so he gives a, a sampling of words that do just that, okay? Abandoned, abused, attacked, betrayed, boxed in, bullied, 
cheated. So there's a, a whole vocabulary of words. Look at this page. He gives all kinds of examples. Okay, so we can start distinguishing between those two. The summary of this chapter says, the second component necessary for expressing ourselves is feelings. By, by developing a vocabulary of feelings that allows us to clearly and specifically name or identify our emotions, we can connect more easily with one another. Allowing ourselves to be vulnerable by expressing our feelings can help resolve conflicts. NVC distinguishes the expression of actual feelings from words and statements that describe thoughts, assessments, and interpretations. Again, there's exercises in here uh, about to help you understand uh, what we just went over. I'm going to read a little bit about uh, taking responsibility for our feelings. Chapter five, he says, hearing a negative message, there are four options. So now he's talking about receiving communication from someone else. The third component of MVC entails the acknowledgement of the root of our feelings. NVC heightens our awareness that, that what others say and do may be the stimulus, but never the cause of our feelings. We see that our feelings result from how we choose to receive what others say and do, as well as our particular needs and expectations in that moment. With the third component, we are led to accept responsibility for what we do to generate our own feelings. When someone gives us a negative message, whether verbally or non-verbally, we have four options as to how to receive it. One is to take it personally by hearing blame and criticism. For example, someone is angry and says, you're the most self-centered person I've ever met. In choosing to take it personally, we might react, oh, I should have been more sensitive. We accept the other person's judgment and blame ourselves. We choose this option at a great cost to our self-esteem for it inclines us toward feelings of guilt, shame, and depression. A second option is to fault the speaker. For example, in response to, you're the most self-centered person I've ever met, we might protest, you have no right to say that. I am always considering your needs. You're the one who is really self-centered. When we receive messages this way and blame the speaker, we are likely to feel anger. When receiving a negative message, our third option would be to shine the light of consciousness on our own feelings and needs. Thus, we might reply, when I hear you saying that, I am the most self-centered person you've ever met, I feel hurt because I need some recognition of my efforts to be considerate of your preferences. By focusing attention on our own feelings and needs, we become conscious that our current feeling of hurt derives from a need for our efforts to be recognized. Finally, a fourth option in receiving a negative message is to shine the light of consciousness on the other person's feelings and needs as they are currently expressed. We might, for example, ask, are you feeling hurt because you need more consideration for your preferences? We accept responsibility rather than blame other people for our feelings by acknowledging our own needs, desires, expectations, values, or thoughts. Note the difference between the following expressions of disappointment. Example one, A, you disappointed me by not coming over last evening. B, I was disappointed when you didn't come over because I wanted to talk over some things that were bothering me. Speaker A attributes responsibility for the disappointment solely to the action of the other person. In B, the feeling of disappointment is traced to the speaker's own desire that was not being fulfilled. 
Um, let's see what we've got here. I'm going to move forward to uh, the summary. The third component of MVC is the acknowledgement of the needs behind our failings. What others say and do may be the stimulus, but never the cause of our feelings. When someone communicates negatively, we have four options as to how to receive the message. Number one, blame ourselves. Number two, blame others. Number three, sense our own feelings and needs. Or number four, sense the feelings and needs hidden in the other person's negative message. Judgments, criticisms, diagnosis, and interpretations of others are all alienated expressions of our own needs and values. When others hear criticism, they tend to invest their energy in self-defense or counterattack. The more directly we can connect our feelings to our needs, the easier it is for others to respond compassionately. In a world where we are often harshly judged for identifying and revealing our needs, doing so can be very frightening, especially for women who are socialized to ignore their own needs while caring for others. In the course of developing emotional responsibility, most of us experience three stages. I'm not going to go into to this part of it. So I'm actually going to skip forward now. And it also talks about acknowledging our needs. There's exercises in here to discover how to acknowledge the need behind the feeling, okay? The last chapter I'm going to read tonight is called chapter uh, six, requesting that which would enrich life. He starts by saying, we, we have now covered the first three components of NVC that address what we are observing, feeling, and needing. We have learned to do this without criticizing, analyzing, blaming, or diagnosing others, and in a way most likely to inspire compassion. The fourth and final component of this process addresses the question of what we would like to request of others in order to enrich life for us. When our needs are not being fulfilled, we follow the expression of what we are observing, feeling, and needing with a specific request. We ask for actions that might fulfill our needs. How do we express our requests so that others are more willing to respond compassionately to our needs? First of all, we express what we are requesting rather than what we are not requesting. How do you do a don't? goes a line of a children's song by my colleague, Ruth Biebermeyer. All I know is I feel won't when I'm told to do a don't. <laughs> These lyrics reveal two problems commonly encountered when requests are worded in the negative. People are often confused as to what is actually being requested. And furthermore, negative requests are likely to provoke resistance. A woman at a workshop, frustrated that her husband was spending so much time at work, described how her request had backfired. I asked him not to spend so much time at work. Three weeks later, he responded by announcing that he'd signed up for a golf tournament. She had successfully communicated to him what she did not want, his spending so much time at work but had failed to request what she did want. Encouraged to reword her request, she thought a minute and said, I wish I had told him that I would like him to spend at least one evening a week at home with the children and me. Okay, so I'm gonna skip forward and uh, see if this has a summary. Making requests consciously. Sometimes we may be able to 
communicate a clear request without putting it in words. Suppose you're in the kitchen and your sister who is watching television in the living room calls out, I'm thirsty. In this case, it may be obvious that she is requesting you to bring her a glass of water from the kitchen. However, in other instances, we may express our discomfort and incorrectly assume that the listener has understood the underlying request. For example, a woman might say to her husband, I'm annoyed you forgot the butter and onions I asked you to pick up for dinner. While it may be obvious to her that she is asking him to go back to the store, the husband may think that her words were uttered solely to make him feel guilty. Even more often, we are simply not conscious of what we are requesting when we speak. We talk to others or at them without knowing how to engage in a dialogue with them. We toss out words using the presence of others as a wastebasket. In such situations, the listener, unable to discern a clear request in the speaker's words, may experience the kind of distress illustrated in the following antidote. I was seated directly across the aisle from a couple on a mini train that carries passengers to their respective terminal, terminals at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. For passengers in a hurry to catch a plane, the snail's pace of the train may well be irritating. The man turned to his wife and said with intensity, I've never seen a train go so slow in all my life. She said nothing, appearing tense and uneasy as to what response he might be expecting from her. He, that, he then did what many of us do when we're not getting the response we want. He repeated himself. In a markedly stronger voice, he exclaimed, I have never seen a train go so slow in all my life. The wife, at a loss for a response, looked even more distressed. In desperation, she turned to him and said, they're electronically timed. I didn't think this piece of information would satisfy him, and indeed, it did not for he repeated himself a third time even more loudly. I have never seen a train go so slow in all my life. The wife's patience was clearly exhausted as she snapped back angrily. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Get out and push? Now there were two people in pain. What response was the man wanting? I believe he wanted to hear that his pain was understood. If his wife had known this, she might have responded, it sounds like you're scared we might miss our plane and disgusted because you'd like a faster train running between these terminals. In the above exchange, the wife heard the, the husband's frustration but was clueless as to what he was asking for. Equally problematic is the reverse situation when people state their requests without first communicating the feelings and needs behind them. This is especially true when the request takes the form of a question. Why don't you go and get a haircut? Can easily be heard by youngsters as a demand or an attack unless parents remember to first reveal their own feelings and needs. We worried that your hair is getting so long it might keep you from seeing things, especially when you're on your bike. How about a haircut? It is more common, however, for people to talk without being conscious of what they are asking for. I'm not requesting anything, they might remark. I just felt like saying what I said. My belief is that whenever we say something to another person, we are requesting something in return. It may be simply an empathetic connection, a verbal or nonverbal acknowledgement as with the man on the train, that our words have been understood, or we may be requesting honesty. We wish to know the listener's honest reaction to our words, or we may be requesting an action that we hope would fulfill our needs. The clearer we are on what we want back from the other person, the more likely it is that our needs will be met. And then he has other ways. Uh, and ideas and tips for requesting what you want. And let's see, I'm gonna read the summary of this chapter then. The fourth component of MVC addresses the question of what are we, what we would like to request of each other to enrich each of our lives. We try to avoid vague, abstract, or ambiguous phrasing 
And remember to use positive action language by stating what we are requesting rather than what we are not. When we speak, the clearer we are about what we want back, the more likely we are to get it. Since the message we send is not always the message that's received, we need to learn how to find out if our message has been accurately heard. Especially when we are expressing ourselves in a group, we need to be clear about the nature of the response we are wanting back. Otherwise, we may be initiating unproductive conversations that waste considerable group time. Requests are received as demands when listeners believe that they will be blamed or punished if they do not comply. We can help others trust that we are requesting, not demanding, by indicating our desire for them to comply only if they can do so willingly. The objective of MVC is not to change people and their behavior in order to get our way. It is to establish relationships based on honesty and empathy that will eventually fulfill everyone's needs. Um, and that is all I'm going to read tonight. Uh, this is a book that you probably would need to have on hand to be able to refer to and use the practices in. Um, I think it's just such a powerful book. I fell in love with Marshall Rosenberg when he gave his uh, keynote speech at one of our conventions. And I really encourage you to get the book and study it um, in order to start communicating with other people in what he would call a nonviolent way a language of life and learn a whole new language in speaking with other people and uh, start giving what you want and getting what you want out of your relationships. So, all right. Thanks for being with us tonight. Have a great week.